morning, church. I, uh, as we were worshiping in song earlier, I thought, man, how do you follow that up? I don't know about you guys, but I was challenged in my heart <laughs> to who God is. And it was, yeah, I went through a couple tissues, so if I cry a little bit today, I'm, I somewhat apologize that I hope it doesn't distract, but Christ is enough for me. Like we sang that. And I was challenged like, man, how true is it? Is he? Like do we share with the world that he's enough? Not only by what we say, not by, not by coming here. Coming here doesn't prove he's enough for us. What does our actions, what does our life look like? Is it proof of who God is and the changing that he's doing in our hearts? And I don't know about you guys, but it made me think about last week with the Global Partnership Conference. I hope you've been able to take part in some of it. But the message last week was so challenging and such a reminder that the world needs Jesus and we're a part of the world and we need to be a part of that change. And if he's enough for us, there's plenty to go around. And then in the last song, man, you could pick out a few quotes, but you restore every heart. I was blown away that he restores mine. Some of you can probably say the same. We recognize the sin in our lives. We recognize what we've done. And he didn't have to reach out to us. Anyway, man, what a good morning so far. We get to continue in the I Am series, and um, a couple weeks ago we, we talked about God saying I Am for the first time uh, to Moses out of a burning bush and really what that means. And we just got a taste, or just a taste. And today we get to transition into his son, who decided to come to earth to die on the cross for us to declare that he is also I am. We get to delve into those over the next seven weeks and I'm excited. We're gonna be spending most of our time today out of John chapter six. So if you wanna turn there, you can. And before we get to our passage this morning, just a preview into uh, the first part of chapter six. The first part of chapter six starts out with the feeding of the 5,000, which many of you are probably familiar with. If not, man, it's a great read. So go ahead and read that at some point. Not now, you should be listening. <laughs> uh, but after, you, after the feeding of the 5,000, Christ feels like they're gonna make him king, which is also ironic because he's already king. But he thinks he's, he feels that they're gonna make him king for the wrong reasons. Could preach a sermon on that, I think. So he steps away and he goes off by himself and his disciples decide to cross the Sea of Galilee. And on the way across, a fierce storm comes and so in the epicness of who Jesus is, he decides to walk out there and, and save them and then they're on the other side of the shore and transitions into a time where you're back with the crowd on the other side of the sea and they're like, hey, where did Jesus go? We wanna see him, we want more of what he has. So they follow him over to the other side of the See, and there's a great interaction between Jesus and, those, and that crowd of people where the crowd of people ask him three questions and Jesus does a great job of answering none of them but getting to the heart of who, what they need to hear. And we see in verse 34, which is right before our text, they say to him, sir, give us this bread always. And I was struck by that this morning because often do we ask for the bread of life, but we forget that it's always available, always there. And we take advantage of it. And it's also interesting because again, what they ask for, as we're gonna read through the text, we're gonna find that's not necessarily what they actually wanted, but it's what they needed. So if you wanna pick up and Verse 35 with me in, in uh, John chapter six, we're gonna read through verse 59 this morning. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. I already lost my place, sorry. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I will never cast out, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, is this not the Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? So Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said this to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. Now we're, at least I'm not, maybe some of you guys are, we're not Jewish so we don't necessarily fully understand the impact, I think, of the statement that Jesus said to them when he said, I am the bread of life. They said, we want what you have to offer us. So he said, here it is. And when he said, I am the bread of life, I'm sure they were thinking about, well, we know about the show bread. We know about sometimes there's grain offerings and all of these things. We know about the manna that our fathers ate and died from. We know all about this. The bread is a major theme throughout the entire scriptures. In fact, we see it first mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, right after he talks with the serpent and then he talks with Eve, he talks to Adam and he tells Adam, you're going to eat bread. So it's early on in the scriptures and it's a theme throughout. And we see these Jews and I'm wondering what, how they would react to that. And I was reminded a couple weeks ago as I was talking through this with someone, they said, do you realize that every country and every culture has a form of bread? I'm like, that's interesting. Like some of the breads, I don't know why anyone would eat, but some of them are pretty tasty. In fact, we get to decide what kind of bread we want at certain sandwich places. And I thought, it's a nice coincidence that Jesus decided to be the bread of life. Like not the, you know, pizza of life or something where it's like not everyone has pizza. He's the bread. And I'm like, wow, what a coincidence. But bread also means more than that. There's more to it than that. But I want to go through, so what does it mean when Jesus said, I am the bread of life? And I think the first thing that we really need to hit on, and that is that Jesus is God. Jesus isn't just a man. I was watching a video that asked the question to people walking by, like, who is Jesus to you? And they said, well, he's that guy that we have Christmas for. Some people would say, like, I, didn't, I don't know who this Jesus is. I've heard of Jesus, but I don't believe in him. I'm not religious, so don't talk to me about Jesus. I think some of us in here may not have a true understanding 
that Jesus is God. In fact, I was, I had the opportunity to take some youth through a Hindu temple. And you might be like, that's kind of weird. It was. It was very odd. And when we went in, the curator or whatever gave us kind of an overview of Hinduism, which, again, odd. I can talk more about that maybe on a private level if you want. But after he talked for a little while and gave us an overview, he took us in to where their worship center was, which was just a collection of idols. We were able to witness a worship service And it was just, it was all just saddening and eye-opening. And we went back into the main part and he said, do you guys have any questions? I said, yeah, I, I, had, I actually do. I have a question for you. Who is Jesus to you? And he goes, oh, that's an interesting question. Like, you mean, we believe he was a good person. Some people within the Hindu religion would say he probably even was a prophet. Um, in fact, at a different Hindu temple, we have a statue of Jesus that sometimes we worship. Talk about chills. Someday that man is going to stand before the sun. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. I checked some statistics. Now, we realize that not all statistics are true, okay? 73% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Um, I used to be a stats teacher, so I know this to be true. (laughs) Um, But these were as accurate as I think as they can be, and we could go into, well, how are they, it doesn't matter. Let's pretend they're real, okay? 92% of Americans believe Jesus truly existed existed. Yeah, I believe he was a person. 80% Jesus is the son of God. 72% say the birth of Jesus is historical fact, which is interesting because 92% believe he existed. There's already discrepancies, right? 41% of Americans believe Jesus existed prior to his physical birth. 65% of evangelicals believe that Jesus existed prior to his birth. Some people are like, well, that's not a huge deal. Like, I still believe he's the son of God. He just didn't exist before his birth. No, that's a huge deal. That's the difference between Jesus being just the son of God and Jesus truly being God. There's a huge difference, and you have to know that. Let's pretend this statistic was true within our church body. Do you realize that that means about 300 to 350 people per Sunday that worship with us believe that Jesus didn't exist before his birth? That's a major problem. But this is a major falsity that's running around our nation today. We have to believe that and promote that. And does it truly change our lives and impact who we are? And it has to go back to the idea of this main question that I asked this Hindu man was, who is Jesus to you? Is he truly God? Because I think if we truly recognize Jesus for what he is, and when we do, and we encounter him in different places in our lives, man, our lives change, and they have to change, because we encounter our creator, But how do we see him as our, how often do we see him truly as God? I mean, I'm one, I I love that we can call him friend. I love that he walks next to me. Trying to work on allowing him to walk in front of me and I just follow. As much as he is our friend though, and a friend of sinners, he is our God and deserves our ultimate worship at all times. It's interesting, 1 Corinthians 5.21 says that he, be, he took our sin, he became our sin so that we could become his righteousness. 
become is an interesting word, and if you look up what the definition is, it means to, to be born again. He took the mess that kept us out from his presence upon to himself so that we could be reborn within the life that only he can give because only he is truly God. And if we don't really understand that, none of what else we're going to talk about over the next six weeks, okay, none of the rest of what we're going to be preaching from this stage for the rest of our lives will matter if you don't get this point. Jesus is God, period. He did exist. Now, we could have a debate on what it looked like. I'm not that smart, but I guarantee he existed, and I guarantee he exists today because he rose from the grave and conquered death by his own power. Because the scriptures attest to that. And I'm so thankful that the Jesus that came fulfilled every single Old Testament prophecy and decided to come and live a life, a perfect life on this earth in order to die for me. And it leads us into our second point is if Jesus saying that he is the bread of life, that means that Jesus is essential for life. It's essential. One of the verses that I thought of comes out of Hebrews 1, verse 3. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. We could talk about Jesus being God, I think, for eternity, and we would never exhaust it, but he holds the world in existence with a single word. We all take our breath because of him. Our universe doesn't explode because of him. He is so vast and so powerful, and he's essential for everything that we do, for every part of our being, and yet how often do we just kind of turn aside To uphold, another word for that is to sustain. And I looked up a couple things with this sustain because a lot of versions use that word. And two of the main definitions that I thought, well, that's interesting. One was endure without failing. He upholds or he sustains or he endures without failing. He doesn't fail once in upholding and sustaining our universe and if he can do that in our universe, he can do that in our own lives. And he does. Aren't we thankful that he endured the cross for us? Aren't we thankful that enduring the cross, man, I, I'm, part of me wishes it was just that, but he endured everything up to the cross too. He endured life on earth. It's not a walk in the park sometimes. He endured being beaten, he endured being mocked, he endured being spit on, he endured being, having flesh ripped off of himself so that he could become our sin and we could claim his righteousness for ourselves. Are you kidding me? He's essential. Another thing that it says is support in any condition. Well, thank goodness, because my conditions change every day. The weather of Wisconsin, we know this. Every now and then we get all four seasons in one day. He supports any condition. Whatever you're going through, ups and downs in life, whatever your friend is going through, he can sustain it, he can endure it because he is God. He is essential. And it needs to happen. Later epistle, John writes in 1 John, he says that, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. You're like, I don't know what propitiation means. I didn't either, but I like to use it sometimes because it sounds like I'm smart. It means that he appeased God's wrath. The wrath of God we deserve. I deserve because of the sin in my life. Jesus Christ endured all of that, upheld all of that, 
bore it on the cross so that he could appease the wrath of God that was meant for me. He is essential for life, which begs the question, how essential is Jesus to you? We have to ask it. How essential is Jesus to you? It's interesting because I wake up every morning and I'm hungry. Shocker. And I want to eat breakfast because that's essential. Because if I don't, I get kind of hangry from time to time. Other people are like, I know people who get a hangry. But man, it's essential. It's interesting because when I was going through, um, I had some trauma informed parenting classes and different things like that. And one of the things they said was, if, someone, if a kid's like acting out sometimes, he's actually acting out because he's, one of his physical needs isn't met. So in my classroom, because I used to teach mathematics, in my classroom, this kid was coming, and I said, are you hungry? He goes, what? I said, are you hungry? He goes, yeah, why? I'm like, I don't know, just curious. Why don't you go get something to eat? He goes, I can't. I said, all right. So I had Pop-Tarts in my lower drawer. You know, Pop-Tarts are the great old breakfast. We could debate which one is better. Anyway, we won't go down that rapid trail. <laughs> he changed. He would sit and listen. His need became met in the morning. I had the privilege of doing what was called a 30-hour famine a few times with um, some past youth groups that I led. If you don't know what the 30-hour famine is, just think about it. It's a 30-hour famine, okay? So we go without food. They say 30 hours is about what your body needs to realize what true starvation, what true hunger feels like. And man, at the end of that 30 hours, I was hungry. And I was with teenagers. So, you know, the best thing to do would be to go to a buffet. Now, some of you are like, that's not a good idea. And you're right. It's not a good idea. Because they needed certain nutrients and certain things at the end of that 30 hours. So we had to be very careful of what we ate. We had to be care very careful of what we allowed them to eat. Can we say that about our spiritual life? Do you wake up hungry? Do you wake up wanting to dive into the word of God because, man, you miss him? God, I, I just slept for eight hours and... I don't, yeah. and, and yet how often do we wake up, and, and Greg kind of alluded to this too, we, we stick with an appetizer, like, yeah, well, yeah, I read my Bible. Okay, you read your Bible, that's fine, but do you do more with it? Does it impact your life? Does it change who you are? Do you think about it the rest of your day? Do you study it? Do you do those things that are needed to be done? Because if Jesus is essential, then you're going to want to do that. And the bottom line is, this is the only thing that is going to truly satisfy your hunger, because when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, what that meant was that he is the only one that can satisfy us. Jesus satisfies our hunger in a way that nothing else can. If I would have e eaten anything I wanted at the end of the 30-hour famine, I probably would have been satisfied. But depending on the length of time, there would have been a time after that that I wouldn't have been really satisfied. There are certain fast food restaurants that satisfy me when I'm eating it, and then I find out that like 30 minutes later, I'm not so satisfied. If you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, that's okay. Maybe they're just for me. But how often do we try and satisfy our hunger with something that truly doesn't satisfy it? I, I probably said that, say this too much, but I like to drink Mellow Yellow. Uh, if you don't know that about me, it's true. Um, I had one this past week, so that, so that was really good. Um, but there's something about it that just, mm, for me, is just, and some people will be like, well, can you tell the difference between Mountain Dew and Mellow Yellow? Uh, can you tell the difference between a semi and a house? I mean, they're different. <laughs> Absolutely I can. What are you saying? Can I tell the difference? In fact, there used to be a time, I don't know if I'm this good anymore. You know, this is something you really want to be good at. I could tell the difference between Mellow Yellow that came out of a bottle, out of a can, and out of a fountain because it's different. You're like, really? I'm like, eh, one of the great skills I have. Woo. You know, like, oh, great. 
That's great, yeah, tell everyone that. But I've been drinking, this is, this is a bad statistic too, I've been drinking Mellow Yellow for about 40 years. And it's the main drink, that and milk, I love milk. <clears throat> Very different nutritional values. <laughs> anyway, I remember sometimes when I go, I don't, do you guys like Culver's? If you don't, it's okay. If, well, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Recently, Culver switched from Mountain Dew to Mellow Yellow. Oh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. You see, because I used to go to Culver's and I'd have the meal and I'm like, I don't know, like their root beer is pretty good. I like Mellow Yellow. And sometimes Mountain Dew would be kind of okay. And I would drink and I'm like, that's all right. But now that I get to wash down a butter burger with mellow yellow, <laughs> there's something about it that just satisfies my appetite that much greater. That's what Jesus Christ wants to do in our life. That's how he wants to satisfy. He doesn't want to be your Mountain Dew. It's a great analogy. Doesn't want to be your, he wants to be what truly satisfies. So it led me to this idea, where in your life does Jesus need to be your true food? Sometimes I sacrificed and drank something else besides mellow yellow. How often do we sacrifice part of our life, part of our spiritual life, part of our emotional and relational lives for something that doesn't truly satisfy because we're trying to stuff it full of stuff that the world says is good. For some of us that could be drugs, for some of us that could be pornography, for some of us that could be alcohol, for some of us that could be video games, you name it, there's the plethora of things that we say, I'm trying to do this to satisfy my hunger and my desire for a savior, my desire for God to be who he says he's supposed to be, and instead of going to the word of God and praying, we go to the world and say, this is going to satisfy me. And guess what? It might satisfy you for a little while, but eventually it won't. Why? Because it's not the true food. Just like some of those other fast food restaurants eventually don't satisfy, those other things in your life will break you down. One of the top reasons... One of the top conflict, conflicts in marriages, and if you're not married, continue to listen, please. And even one of the top reasons for divorce is based upon dissatisfaction. Specifically, they say, well, for you to have a vibrant and healthy married life, there needs to be sexual fulfillment within your marriage. And if you're not finding that, go find it someplace else. It's a lie from the pits of hell. God does not guarantee us that when we become married in his scriptures that that means we are going to be sexually fulfilled. But what do we look for? Because the world says that's what we want to look for. That's what we chase after. And through pornography and even through TV shows, they say this is the end goal for a healthy marriage. And guess what? It's not. And this hit me a few years ago because I watched healthy marriages where one of them was disabled, have a vibrant marriage life, they can't have sexual fulfillment. God calls us not to sexual fulfillment, but relation to, relational intimacy. See how the world distorts it? They say this is the true food. Why? Because it feels the best, because it makes you feel good. And sometimes that thing is, doesn't make it a bad thing in marriage, but it doesn't make it the end goal. The end goal is to have great intimacy with our spouse. And while that maybe can be led to by acts of physical, there's so much more. Jesus is saying he is so much more. And Jesus needs us to remember that. And I want to go back because I was reminded as I was thinking about this topic that when someone repeats something, there's a reason for the repeat. And when the scriptures repeat, Hmm, maybe we should listen even that more intently. Go back to chapter three, with, or chapter three. Chapter six with me in verse 53. So you know, there's a three in there. 
So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And he continued to say these things in the synagogue at Capernaum. Did you hear the repeat? I tried to stress it. Whoever feeds on me. It made me think of this. Are you ready to feast? Are you ready to feast? Because it's time. Jesus being the bread of life. Man, I think of the phrase, you you break bread with other people and you sit around a table. There's a song by the Sidewalk Prophets called Come to the Table. It's an interesting song that talks about so many different types of people coming to the table. And you know the beauty of that? We can invite as many people as we want to the table and the food will never run out. You will never get enough of Jesus if you continually dive in and look for him and go after him and seek after him. He is the flesh that we need to feed on. He is who we need to chase. Let's stop chasing the world. Let's stop chasing the things that the world says, this will please you, this will satisfy you, because eventually they won't. They might feel good in the moment, they might be all right, but it's not gonna give you the satisfaction that only Jesus can give. As I was preparing for this too, I thought, man, I would love to give you guys time to reflect. So I'm gonna call Johnny and Addison up here to get ready and they're gonna, they're gonna lead a song. And here's what we would like you guys to do during this song. We want you guys to reflect. Think about some of the things that were just said. Think about what God is stirring in your heart, what Jesus is saying to you right now. When the song is playing, there's gonna be words up. It's gonna be a new song. but we just want you to reflect how you want to reflect. If that's sitting with your eyes closed for the entire song, we would love to see that. If that's standing up, that's fine. But please don't think that if the person next to you or the person in front of you stands up that you need to. This is a personal time for you to reflect on who Jesus is and Jesus as the I am and what that means. Gentlemen. Yes, just to add one thing to that. There's not actually going to be words up during the song. Um, So yeah, we just invite you to kind of take this opportunity to sit, take in the words and just think, think of the reasons why do you call Jesus, God, Father, the great I am. What has he done for you through your life to give you the reason to acclaim that name to him? And yeah, we're just going to praise him for that.
beginning and the end it's you you conquered death upon the cross you took my sin now I've been washed you said I'm covered was a heart response to thinking about the I am. Jesus is the bread of life. So what? So what are we going to do with that? Who is Jesus to you? Has 
to be answered. Genesis 1.1 said, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Jesus is God, but who is he truly to you? How essential is Jesus to you? How often do we run to other things in the world instead of to our creator who is the essence of life, who is life, who upholds the universe with a single word? And are you feasting or just getting by? There's plenty to go around. Jesus is the true food that will only is the and the only thing that will satisfy your hunger. And there's many people around us that need to feast as well. That have never known Jesus as their God. As we're feasting, man, I love sharing great stories about meals I've sat down to and how good they are. I think it's time for us to do the same as we sit down and we feast on our Savior and share about all the good things that he is doing in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord Father, we come to you this morning not worthy to enter your presence, yet because of your Son. We have new life. We have your Son The Holy Spirit dwells within us, and because of that, you welcome us into your presence. Help us to to leave this place with a yearning to know you deeper, to love you more, to share you greatly. You are the greatest story ever told. Help us to declare it. there's things in our lives that need to change. Identify those for us. Give us the strength to deal with them appropriately and the humbleness to allow you to enter that space. And if we need help, may the church be the help that you have called us to be. Thank you for the time we've had this morning. We praise you in your precious name. Amen. Would you stand for a final word this morning? This comes out of the end of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. You're released to a week of work, witness, and worship. God bless.